Hello, and welcome to Conversations with me, Dr. Theo Blackmore, part of the Discover Voices Media Network. Today I am talking to Colin Barnes. Colin Barnes. So um, a lot of people will know you as Professor Colin Barnes or Dr. Colin Barnes and a doctor in the field of disability studies. And today, really, I wanted to talk about um, you and your background and where you where you're from and how you got to where you are and all of that kind of history stuff that I don't actually know anything about, having read, even though I've read many of your books and your papers. So perhaps you could begin with your journey. That's fine. That's 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 not one for blowing my own trumpet, but I'm quite happy to talk about where I come from because if if you don't understand my upbringing, you will not really understand how easily it was for me to become involved in disability studies. That's okay with you. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's absolutely what I'd like to hear. Yeah. Okay. Well. I was born in in 1940s. Um, my father was um, had a genital visual impairment. He had congenital cataract, which means you're born blind, and and they do an operation, a, a needling operation, and you can see, but you don't have lenses in your eyes, so you're permanently disabled, if you like, if you use that that phrase. Uh, my father was born in 23. He was born in England and his parents took him to Canada uh, after, after he was about six months old. So he grew up in Montreal, in, in French Canada, basically. Right. And uh, he wasn't, wasn't in any special schools in any way whatsoever. He went to French speaking schools and all that sort of stuff, but grew up in Canada left school when he was 11 and worked for his father, who was a sign writer and um, artist, basically. And my father delivered for him and stuff like that. But the relationship between my grandparents wasn't very good. So my grandmother left my, my grandfather in Canada and my dad followed her and came to England in 1938, okay, as a visually impaired man. Now, not been in special schools at all. And he'd never been segregated in, in Montreal in any way whatsoever. But when he came to Leeds in 1938, I think he was about 15 or 16, something like that, he couldn't get a job, basically, because Leeds was all printing, engineering. And when he went for, to get jobs, people would just look at him and say, well, I'm sorry, lad, but we can't employ you because it's dangerous and you wouldn't be able to do the work and all that stuff. So he ended up in a sheltered workshop for blind and visually impaired people. And he was trained as a, a basket maker. It was a skilled job. You know, they, in, in those days, in the 1940s and 50s, the GPO or the post office as it was then used to have what they call skips, big baskets where they put all the stuff in. And my father was trained to do that sort of thing. He made um, basket chairs on the side and things like that. So he's very handy. He wasn't a disabled in the sense that um, he never moaned about being visually impaired because he grew up with it, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And most of it was, um, he got married. Uh, um, to a lovely woman from York, who was my mother, and uh, he, I was born in 1946, and we lived in, um, I, w I suppose, listening to, what was it the other day on the radio, Graham Nash talking about the kind of house he grew up in, which would have been defined as a slum, basically. It was one up, one down with a toilet up the street and all that kind of stuff. My yeah. father worked in a sheltered workshop, and as I say, was trained um, as a basket maker. And just to summarise his, his experience at work, he retired in the nineteen in nineteen sixty one or two, I think, 
But over the period of working, he was a basket maker, skilled man. In the 1950s, uh, GPO, as then was, didn't want any baskets. So they couldn't get contracts. So he retrained to make mats, basically the kind of doormats you get. Then the, the market for that changed. Then he was trained to do plasticized gates, things like that. So you see metal gates that are covered in plastic so they don't rust and stuff like that. So all these sort of de-skilling processes continued until in the 19, late 1950s, 60s, he ended up counting out screws and bolts and putting them in boxes basically yeah. and that's just before he retired uh, he, re he retired early because he just couldn't face doing that for a living so basically i watched him be skilled if you see now my parents took me to school an ordinary school uh, in 1950 basically i was there for a short period of time and then the school decided that because of my eyesight, I would have to go to a special school. Okay. So they sent me to a, a school which was basically was a, a residential school for blind and deaf children, basically. Uh, it was called Lawn's House and it was opened in 1949 and closed in 1953. Now, this is the kind of issue that you face. It was a school for deaf kids, blind kids. Now, the logic of doing that is, is beyond belief because blind kids communicate orally and deaf kids communicate physically, you know, with their hands and stuff. Anyway, the upshot was that I was there for three years. So you had that students that you couldn't communicate with each other. The blind students couldn't communicate. Yeah, with of course. Students. Oh, so you were divided. You were yeah. not divided, if you see what I mean. You were divided in the sense that we used to wear a school uniform, which was a grey jumper with different coloured... You had a tie which had red stripes across if you were a visually impaired kid, and if there were blue stripes across if you were a blind kid, a deaf kid, you see what I mean. Uh, and you were in, educated in different classes. So that was my upbringing to a, the age of seven. Now, the school closed in 53, but they opened a, resi a special class um, mainstream junior school in Leeds, which is where I lived. Um, and I went to that school, that class, basically. And that class was uh, had nine children in it, aged between five and 13. I was seven, nine wow. kids, and it was a class, the end of an ordinary school. You know, so that the ordin other kids were all in classes of same age groups, and each year the age group would move up. We were all together, and we did stuff. You know, we did reading and writing in the morning, and in the afternoon we did storytelling and stuff like that. Now I was very lucky because my parents were didn't want me to be in a special school. And when I got to 11, it was an opportunity for me to go to a mainstream school, secondary school. And um, we didn't do the 11 plus because we weren't considered, the education we got didn't give us that kind of background, basically. I mean, when I left school, I could knit and I could do raffia work and stuff like that, because that's what we did in the afternoon. You know, uh, we were taken to school in a taxi, brought home in a taxi, all that sort of stuff. And when I was 11, 11 and a half, I got the opportunity to try going to a mainstream school, which I did. My parents wanted me to go, so I ended up going to a mainstream school, which at about 11. But my, my dad didn't earn a lot of money. So my mother worked and she sometimes had two jobs, basically, because we didn't have a lot of money. Right? And after I got sent to special school or residential school, my mother started to have nervous breakdowns. 
and then because it I can see her now and I was on the steps at the school and she was in tears she took me to school leave me at school if you know what I mean anyway the upshot was she was defined with mental health problems and stuff and she ended up having um being defined as a schizophrenic and she was in and out of hospital throughout the 50s and early 60s you know she when I got older and got married and stuff like that and settled down that's when she sort of stabilized but so I had a father with a sheltered workshop I had um, a mother who'd got mental health problems do not get me wrong I had a great childhood it gave me confidence um, I've never felt the only things that, that they gave me was to feel angry about being called specky four eyes and stuff like that. And I used to get into fights at school, especially at junior school, when kids said, you know, stuff like that. But I've never had a problem with my eyesight because I grew up with it, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Anyway, when I left school, I mean, I went into to West Park School in Leeds and I went in, in the E stream because of the education thing. But I ended up in the B stream. Because, you know, I just, don't ask me, I, I just seem to be able to get to work okay, no problem at all. I left school at 15, no O-levels, and they, me as officer, um, suggested that I go in the hospitality industry, basically. I mean, mother thought that was great because everybody needs food and all that sort of stuff. Because I couldn't go into printing and I couldn't go into engineering, couldn't drive or anything like that. So I went to a uh, local college and did a two-year course, national diploma in hotel management, basically. Which was, believe it or not, passed everything. I had to do 14 different exams. Uh, we had to, to sort of work in kitchens and stuff like that. And when I left there, I went to work in a hotel for a while, but didn't like that because I wanted to be with all my mates at weekends and stuff like that. And in hotels, you have to work weekends and split shifts and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was, I was gifted in the sense that um, if you've done sociology, you know, about sort of covering and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Which, which was easy for me because my dad taught me how to live in a mainstream world and all that sort of thing. So I didn't have a problem with it at all. I just got on with life. And, um, of course, socially, the 60s were brilliant for people like me because in the 1965, you know, a band from America came over to England called The Loving Spoonful and they had wire-rimmed grasses. Right? And, of course... Once John Lennon saw that, he got wiring glasses. So I got wiring glasses and I was really, I had a great 60s, if you know what I mean. Brilliant. Went to work. Yeah, I really did. Yeah. I went, I went to work at a, um, John Waddington's in the kitchen, basically. And I could cook and I I went in there as, as executive chef for the director's dining room. There were seven directors and 30 executives because Waddington's was a major card maker and, as I say, in the 60s and stuff like that. I met a lovely woman who I'm still married to, and we had a daughter, and she's got a visual impairment, just like me. So, basically, I'd grown up with all this. And in the 70s, after working at Waddington's for a while, I didn't want to stay there. You know, I wanted to get out. So I went to night school um, and did three O levels, which was um, at night school, I did sociology, English and economics. It was interesting. I mean, I was in working, I got money. So we had a house, child. My daughter went to mainstream schools. She didn't, we made sure that she didn't go to special schools. It was never really suggested because I I wasn't in a special school and all that stuff. But we stayed in Leeds where the school was. And um, in 79, the, uh, we got machines in, so there was no need for lots of cook cooking and all that, that sort of stuff. Would that be 79 or 69? 79, sorry. And... Uh, 
redundancy came along, so I took that, no problem at all, and got redundancy money and um, bought a jukebox and went to New Orleans with the money. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, we had it. And then I didn't want to go back into catering. So I went to work. Um, I did some training as a counsellor, worked for the um, National Children's Home Fam Family Network as a counsellor. Basically, it was telephone counselling. And in 1980, a um, group of young people was established in Leeds. Basically, Leeds had special schools. Yeah. When kids left school at 15, there was nowhere for them to go. Yeah. No, there was nothing special at all. Yeah. So that's what I was doing as well as doing this uh, counselling thing. And we, I decided that I wanted to change at that point and do something within the context of disability. Yeah. So one of the things that... Uh, I noticed, I found out from my father, a couple of the lads that I'd been at special school with ended up in the 1960s in my father's workshop, special school, special workshop for blind and visually impaired people. But it was all disabled people altogether. I mean, the interesting thing was that my father's friends were disabled people as well as blind people. I mean, I've got pictures of a really tall chap and a small chap. We had a, a really good friend of the family called, and I won't say his name because I don't know whether his family's still alive or not, but Colin had, um, his name was Colin, but he had cerebral palsy, and we lived in a second-story flat from 1953, so we had to go help Colin up the stairs and all that sort of stuff. So I always knew what disabled people of various impairments had to face in life. Yeah. And when I got to, to 80, 80, 81, I thought the best thing I could do because of my background was teach disabled kids how not to be disabled in the traditional disabled sense, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So I applied to go to teacher training college but basically, it was a college that specialised in teaching teachers in further education. Right. So the college was a one-year course, basically, and it didn't teach you particular issues around any particular skill or job. So basically, I had to apply. And because I wanted to do special education, teaching disabled kids not to be disabled, they didn't have anything to do with special education at this college. The college was about teaching you teaching skills, how yeah. to set up, set up lesson plans, how to present things, how to run courses for a year. That was the kind of college it was. So when I went to the interview, they said, well, you've got catering skills you've got catering qualifications which i had i'd got city and gills in cookery and stuff like that um but i said i don't want to do that but they said well we 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 don't have any examinations on special education so i said well i'll can do catering but she said well when i went to the interview she said well what i'll have to do is I'll have to get you to do another interview. We've got one lecturer who can specialise in special education. So rather than just do one interview, I had to go to two interviews. So when I went to teacher training college, it was in Huddersfield, basically. After the second year, when you, or the second part of this course, you had to produce curriculum. So I had to produce two curriculums, one for catering, teaching kids how to do um, cookery and do cookery practice, and one for special education. So I did that, and of course I got um, 
got a commendation, a merit award, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there was nobody there at the college who understood what we were actually talking about. So we actually set up a group of people who were interested. And it was ended up as about seven of us, basically. It was me as a disabled person. All the other people that were involved were parents of disabled kids and stuff. Yeah. And the interesting thing was that when I left there, I got offered a job teaching catering subjects. But one of the lecturers at the college who I talked to about issues about disability said to me, um, since you feel so strongly about all this, don't you think you should do something more rather than just getting a job in day centres, which I could have gone to a day centre as an activity organiser. That was one job that was offered to me at Leeds, following on from the contract group. So I was still work, going to see the contact group while I was working, if you see what mm -hmm. I mean. So he said, why don't you go try for university and do something serious? So I applied to Leeds University. I went to an interview um, in 1982. And of course, like, being naive, never been at university, I got dressed up, you know, put a suit on and all that tie and things. And I had an Hang on a minute, we're a little bit confused because you say that was 1982. Do you think it was probably 82. not, not so 79? It was 82. Okay. I left, I left Waddington's in 80. Okay. Worked for a year. Then went to teach a training college, left yeah. there after a year in 82. Yeah. Right. And that is when I went to Leeds University. Okay. Am I mixing my mixing you up? No, no, no. You got me, you got me. I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm there. I mean, it, it, it's trying to summarize all this, basically. Yeah. Is is so I went to this interview, and as I say, this Rob Towler bloke. I was there at 11 o'clock, sat outside waiting, and he turned up at about quarter past 11, and I was, I would say, agitated, furious, if you thought, well, what's he in here, you know, and all that. And he just sort of strolled up, and he, he said, oh, I'm sorry I'm late. And I said, uh, it's okay, you know. I said, well, uh, you applied to do sociology and I said yeah basically and I told him why and he said well why do you want to do sociology and I just said I want to do disability I want to do disability discrimination he looked at me and he says no he just looked at me and he said okay you're in but you'll have to do exams because obviously I didn't have any O levels yeah, levels, anything. Um, so I did that, and that's how I ended up at Leeds University. My daughter was at school. I didn't want to move out of Leeds or anything, so it was obvious to me that I should go straight through to Leeds, if you see what I mean. And uh, I did a degree. I did a degree in sociology, and my dissertation... Um, I didn't have anything on disability, obviously. I did sociology and politics, specialised in politics and uh, medical sociology and research methods and things like that. And for my dissertation, I produced this, basically. What is that is, for people who are listening or not? Blue, it's just the front page. It yeah. says discrimination and disabled people. Okay. Sociology of disability. And this was in 1994-5. Okay. And it's divided into introduction, the contextual, the, con the context, the contextivity and definition, the origins of discrimination. Discrimination in modern society, the experience of disability, conclusion, bibliography. And it was 17,000 words. Wow. 
Now, you're only supposed to do 10,000 words. Yeah. Because of what it was, I got away with it and got a merit award. Again, I... And... Um, because of that, because of the interest, it was, why don't you do a PhD, basically? So I applied to do a PhD. And uh, I went on to work with the contact group, basically. I mean, yeah. the interesting thing was that when I when I got my PhD, I mean, again, going back to being lucky, I was married with a, with a lovely wife and a, a daughter. In those days, that's the 1980s, you could go to university Without having to pay fees, because I would never been able to afford to go to university. Now, this is what I mean. I've been very lucky. You yeah. couldn't do that now. One of the things while I was teaching at university was that over the years, number of mature students coming to university really slowed down, yeah. because of the fees. Now yeah. I was lucky because when I went to university. You got grants to go to university. You applied to uh, local authorities and the SRC, but you got grants to go to university as a mature student. Because I was 34 when I went to do an undergraduate degree. Yeah. And then when I went on to do the PhD, I was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. So, I mean, obviously, all the time I was at university, I was working as well. Um, I have some friends who, who had a business uh, selling kids' clothes, and I, I used to go going working at weekends. Um, my my mates would pick me up, and we'd go to a market basically and set up a stall and sell kids' clothes. And I loved it; it was great. You know, come on, girl. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, because I'd worked with women when I was working at Waddington's. I had a kitchen and there was 30 women working in the kitchen. There was only about three or four men, but all the rest were women. So I, it was easy. It was great, you know. Anyway, but that's that's another story. So the point was, I did a PhD with um contact group, basically. And the whole point of, of the PhD was to show how disabled kids are disabled. You know, um, it led to this. This is my my dissertation. Yeah, it's bit. It, it is actually the book is a dissertation. I didn't have to change anything. It's about the social creation of dependence. It's called cabbage syndrome. Right. And basically, what what. When I was at university, because they, there wasn't any disability stuff, you had to find it out for yourself, if you know what I mean. And it started started to um, find out about Finkelstein. Yeah. He wrote this in 1980, Attitudes and Disabled People, which is criticised by lots of people uh, because it was a Marxist analysis of how society and the way it's organized began discriminating against disabled people with the dawn of capitalism see what i mean because they couldn't fit into the workplace and all kind of stuff like that that's vic finkelstein yeah yeah and well we'll get to i met vic but that's later i got this from uh odd colin Lowe, right who was um my supervisor for my undergraduate dissertation. I had two supervisors. One was called Ray Pawson, who I'll get to in a minute when we get to my interleads as a, for a job. Ray was a teacher in um, research methods. Now he supervised me and he's been a champion of what I was doing, basically. So again, I was lucky. And Colin Lowe was a lecturer at Leeds, who's now Lord Lowe, basically. And he was blind and he gave me this in 1983-4. And then I 
found out about Mike Oliver's social work and disabled people. And I wrote to Mike Oliver, basically, who sent me an email, sent me a, a slip for his book, buy my book, which is basically social work for disabled people. And of course, they all sort of, oh, look, you know, what I've been doing has been going on with other people doing the same sort of thing, which all led to this. Because this has got theory in it, it's got practice, and it's got it's got chapters on how you. I mean, basically, I did um, in the chap working chapters with the book. I would talk, describe how disabled people had to get around in Leeds. I mean, I did love a lovely thing with a woman called Janet, who was really interested in the library at Leeds, basically. Now, Janet was a wheelchair user and the day centre where, where one of the day centres was about 15 minutes walk for me from the day centre to Leeds Library. So basically I timed that and I took Janet to the library. It was a wheelchair user and it took something like 40 minutes. And of course she couldn't get in because there was no, it's all steps. She had to go to the back and we had to wait and all that sort of stuff. And it's all in here, basically. In and this is this sure. came out in 1990. So I'd done all that, basically. And then in 1980, while I was working on the PhD and stuff, I started teaching. I got, so after your first year at university, you're encouraged to to do other things and I, you're allowed to teach for six hours a week. So from 1986, seven, while I was doing my PhD, I was working and I went to work at Trinity and All Saints College in Leeds, which is yeah. another university now, it's Trinity University. And I was teaching sociology of deviance, but bringing in disability and using people like Paul Hunt's reanalysis of language, you know, people yeah. with disabilities and all that kind of stuff. So this was all being built into courses at Trinity and All Saints and at Leeds, because in my final year, was te you do lectures and stuff. And in the first year, Sociology was then open to all students who wanted to do extra courses. So you could do lectures on disability. And I introduced a lecture on disability to a deviance course, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So I was teaching disability for 1989 on a part time basis. I tried my PhD finished in 1989 and I was looking for, for work. And that's when I came across the advert for BCODP to do discrimination. BCODP being? The British Council of Organisations for Disab of Disabled People. Yeah. That was an, an organisation, national organisation, which was of organisations controlled and run by disabled people. Yeah. organizations like derbyshire coalition for disabled people yeah. manchester coalition for disabled people um spinal injuries association all these organizations came together in 1981 to go to the international um conference on disability which was because 1981 was the international year of disabled people yeah and BCODP was formed in 1981, brought all these, it brought seven organisations together so that a delegation could go to this international conference on disability, which was the international, um, Disabled People's International Conference, which was set up in 1981. Now that was an organisation that had 40 organisations from all over the world organizations controlled and run by disabled people this is not organizations for rehabilitation it's political organizations 
because yeah. 1981 was the year of international UN year of disabled people. The next decade is the year of disabled people. And of course, that genocide led to a growth of disability, disability organisations. You know, Manchester Coalition, for example, Greater Manchester Coalition of Disabled People was set up in 1985, basically. You know, to, and it focused on disability culture straight away, if you see what I mean. There were organisations in, in London, you know, um, which were all focusing on the politics of disablement. It grew seriously in, in that decade, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And of course, I was in the right place at the right time. You know, in 1980, Rachel Hurst, who is down near you somewhere, basically. Uh, she had an organisation called Disability Matters or something like that, basically. We produced a, a network. If you go onto the Disability Archive at Leeds, you'll see all these organisations listed there, but we'll get to that when we talk about Leeds. And when I applied to the BCODP, I mean, it's interesting. It just shows the difference. Um, I had to go down to London for an interview in 1989. Now, I didn't, I went down to London on my own. Now, in London then, there was no, it wasn't easy to negotiate the tubes and things like that, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. And my appointment was something like one o'clock because of nerves and all that sort of stuff i set off at half past six got down to london something like half past nine went on the tube and how we worked the tube my wife hillary and my wife is my wife hillary and i went through the number of stations that you have to get to to get to where bcod uh, spinal injuries offices were in london so when i got onto the tube i had to ask where the tube was, which tube to get. I got on the train and, of course, couldn't see, you know, where the tubes are. And you just had to count the stations before yeah. you got off and all that sort of stuff. So, interestingly, when I actually got there, uh, I went to the spinal injuries office and they said, well, there's somebody coming, there's somebody else waiting who's before you. So I went, okay, it doesn't matter. I'll go wait outside or somewhere. And interestingly, they came later because the other chap didn't turn up. So they asked me to come to earlier. They come to one of their staff came to find me. So I sat outside a roundabout somewhere. They came to find me and they said, Well, you can come now because uh, whoever it was was going to for the interview before me. And I went in and uh, the interview panel was Mike Oliver, Jane Campbell, um, and Stephen Bradshaw, all wheelchair users. And there was no chair. There was no chair for you. No. <laughs> yeah. You ask. <laughs> to get me a chair brilliant which was quite interesting but um the interview was was you know why do you want to do this and i went through basically what i told you i told them about this coming out in 1989 and of course because there was somebody else um waiting um, who couldn't get there for some reason. They couldn't tell me whether I'd got the job or not, whatever. Um, but the interesting thing was that it was a really good interview, basically. I was nervous, obviously. You know, Mike Oliver was there. He'd written social work and disabled people and all that sort of stuff, you know, and I thought, oh, God, you know. Um, but one of the things that he asked me was, he were a disabled person. And of course, I said, no, definitely not. Being, you know, well, 
can get around. I don't have a problem. I've got no problems with being who I am and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And of course he said to me, oh, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't align yourself with anybody who's arguing for political dynamic disability. And I said, well, of course. So, well, do you understand what I mean? Of course, light bulb went on. Because obviously, you know, if you've gone through your life covering and saying, oh, well, I'm not disabled, I can do this and I can do that and get on with it. Yeah. And you think, oh, well, I'm not disabled. But of course, politically, I've always been disabled, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was uh, interesting. Anyway, a um, couple of weeks later, I got the interview. Yeah, you've got you've got the job, basically. So the first job started properly in 1990. And the first thing I did was go to a BCODP general meeting which was the first week in January 1990. And it was at Manchester Town Hall. And it started at half past 11 and didn't finish well, well, <laughs> half past four. Right. And it had people like um, Rain Gradwell, you know, Even loads of people there arguing about what they were going to do, what they ought to do. And they introduced me, you know, and I'm sat there thinking, what is this? We just argue all day, basically. And they asked me what I was going to do. And I said, well, I'm going to do uh, discrimination on disabled people. And Steve, um, one of the people said, well, you're going to have to focus on education and employment i said yeah i'll have to do that but um that's not enough it'll have to be education employment transport environment cultural environment and of course history because it's all in here if you see what i mean uh, yeah if you see what i mean because now, everybody understands then, you know, they thought, oh, get people into work and get people, but that's not enough. It never was, if you see what I mean. Yeah. I mean, that's implicit in Vic's writing, and it's implicit, it's implicit in Mike's writing. But at that time, Mike hadn't published Politics of Disablement. That came out in 1990, yeah. same year as this. Yeah. So then... When the BCODP research project was set up properly, the search was going to be run by a supervisor, which was Mike Oliver, and it was going to be a committee of disabled people who would monitor the project, basically. This was the book, because Rachel had put this argument together because the, the first attempt to get anti-discrimination legislation on the political agenda was in 1981 by Jack Ashley, yeah. a deaf chap who wanted to get like, And of course, everybody had thrown it out and said, oh, there's no such thing as discrimination against disabled people. All the charities were saying, no, there's, we'd look after them. There's not, it's a medical issue and all that sort of stuff. All that was going on in the 1980s. Yeah. Uh, the, the then Spastic Society, for example, set up a, um, a voadal group, the Voluntary Organisations for Anti-Discrimination Legislation in 1985. They set that up to look at discrimination. Now, the interesting thing that Mike told me was that he went to the first meeting. Now, this is organization for people with cerebral palsy that set this organization up it was supposed to have other organizations come to it um michael couldn't get in because it was on the first floor and there were no lifts mike was a wheelchair user sorry mike was a wheelchair user famously no yeah well mike oliver was a wheelchair user. i mean mike 
uh, he broke his back diving into a swimming pool when he was 17. Yeah. Uh, so he was a member of Spinal Injury So Stephen Bradshaw did the same thing. And of course, Vic Finkelstein, he was a spinal injury chap. He he broke his back in in South Africa. I mean, he was a, he was a political activist against apartheid, was Vic. I know. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, these people were... You know, one of the things I'm really interested in is so Vic Finkelstein was um, a political activist in the anti-apartheid era in South Africa. And a lot of the language, I think, that from the anti-apartheid movement moved into the social model of disability. Uh, well, he was. I mean, this is this, this, this politics of this attitudes and disabled people. It's not about the environment. It's all about heads. Yeah. Culture, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And it, it, it's that all links in to, you know, if you've grown up with disability, you know that it's not just about the environment, it's about discrimination. And it's, as I def well, we get to that in a minute. But the point was that because of this, because the organisation was a multi impairment related structure, um, the first month, two months of the project, from 1990 onwards, I went round to see all the people that were significant in the disabled people's movement, like going to see Rachel Hurst, going to see Vic Finkelstein, going to uh, over to Derbyshire to see Maggie, um, Maggie, oh, I can't remember his name, which will hate me in a minute, but the people that... Derbyshire Coalition, who set up um, Dial UK, uh, set up all those things. You know, I went to see all those people, talked to all these people. They asked me what I was going to do with the discrimination project and all that sort of stuff. And I told them that the aim of the project was to provide evidence. Discrimination was a major issue. And it needed legislation. And of course, coming from where I'd been at university, the obvious thing to do was to provide not just verbal evidence, because nobody takes any notice of that, basically. Yeah. What we needed was evidence, numbers. And of course, what I did was just stack, bring together numerical evidence to show how were houses how many houses were built that were accessible yeah how many buildings were accessible how and it it's got well, the project basically over the next 18 months because once i started the project i had to sort of got this to use as a background which has got a history of disability and unlike vic and mike this book talk, talks about how discrimination goes really back to the dawn of contemporary society, if you like. I mean, if you go back to the ancient Greeks, you know, euthanasia for disabled children was normal. You see yeah. what I mean? Because if you think about citizenship in older societies, citizenship in Rome and Greece, you know, participation involved being in the military services. And of course, if you can't, you're not physically fit you can't be an inverted commas a citizen there are exceptions of course like i claudius and stuff like that but um generally euthanasia uh was standard practice for disabled kids if you see what i mean and of course yeah. that runs throughout you've only got to look at you know the greek gods like anyway you don't want to listen to that because it's all in the book so it had to have a history it had to have education it had to have health and social support services. It had to have transport. It had to have environment. It had to have culture and politics. And I had to sort of sh show everybody that that was going to be. So over the next 18 months, I was bringing all this stuff together, submitting chapters every month I'd ship submit the draft of a chapter to the advisory committee for them to scrutinise, to know what I was doing. So 
it was that kind of project. Everybody who was involved in the committee knew exactly what was coming out of this book. Yeah. Which is, this is the second edition, basically. What's that book called? I can't see it. Sorry, it's Discrimination and Disabled People, a Case yeah. for Anti-Discrimination Legislation. This came out in September 1991. First copy, okay. Yeah. And sold, uh, it was produced by Rachel's company, basically, Hearst & Co. We couldn't get anybody else to publish it, basically. Yeah. It was a, so, it's, I mean, he didn't just publish this. So the book is, you know, I was going to read all that. Disabled people aren't going to read it. Yeah. What we produced besides that was um, leaflets. Or <laughs> leaflets saying three things like evidence shows that disabled people are three times more likely to be unemployed than non-disabled people. Disabled people are three times more. All those kind of sort of significant, simple things that we could argue about. And BCODP got money from... Uh, Joseph Rountree and various other organisations to produce leaflets and all that kind of stuff. And it was circulated up and down the country so that disabled people could argue with evidence from this. See what I mean? And um, over the next five years, until 1995, besides working at Leeds, I spent visiting disabled people's organisations. Uh, Mike and I went to Parliament in 1981 for the case for anti-discrimination legislation. Um, I spoke at the first European Day of Disabled People, which was in 1993, um, arguing for anti-discrimination legislation. And that was, it. that was all after I'd got a job at Leeds to set up disability studies which is now on two o'clock. So you, it is now on two o'clock. It is, you just, yeah. You just said an hour. You just casually mentioned that you set up the Leeds Disability Studies degree uh, course. Well, we'll talk, to, we'll talk about that next week. We'll talk about That's that next week. Okay. That's talk brilliant. About, talk about my experiences at Leeds next week. Okay. Think of questions after what I've said. Uh, anything that's not clear or burbling. Ken and Maggie Davis. And Ken will hate me for forgetting his name. Ken and Maggie Davis. There we go. But, you see, I didn't take any notes because I thought it was going to be a conversation. You know. Yeah. No. Well, you know. You know, Colin. It's very difficult to get a word in edgeways when you get on your uh, when you get on your bicycle. It's very difficult to stop you. So next week. Okay. Ask me about this, and we'll have a week on on everything that I've done at Leeds, basically. Okay. And while I was at Leeds and going to all these places and stuff, is that okay? Yeah. So, what, I, did... what, I mean, one of the things that was a complete surprise to me was that how the whole Upias thing happened before you even got involved, really, before you became really? aware of all that sort of stuff. Say what. The whole okay. UP UPIUS, the Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation, they had their meeting and produced the fundamental principles of disability, but that has all happened before you actually got involved in the disability world. Oh, of course, yeah. 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 I mean, when I found out about him, Paul Hunt... Yeah. You know, but I mean, the, the interesting thing is, um, when I became involved in disabled people's movement, if you like, yeah. During the 1980s, there was nothing in Leeds, nothing yeah. at all. And at first, I thought, oh, God, it's all down, you know, London, Manchester, Derby. Derby was all political as well. Yeah. I mean, it was really wound up in, but BCODP, uh, up until BCODP, when it was formed in 1981, only had seven organizations. Yeah. There were only seven organisations, really, that were really owned and run by disabled people, which is yeah. astonishing. 
because by the time this came out, this is the second edition, yeah. there were over 80 organisations all over the... And all that happened during the 1980s. Yeah. Nobody knew, nobody, you know, outside spinal injuries knew about all Hunt. Yeah. I mean, when I teach, well, we'll talk about all this next week. And so one more thing that I was going to say is that your the story about BCODP and your involvement with BCODP and the history of BCODP is all written in a very neat book by a certain Connie Barnes. What was the book called? I haven't written the I haven't written the history of BCODP. I'm sure you wrote a book. You wrote a book and it talks a lot about BCODP because you. Oh, this, with... this is all about BCODP. Yeah, disabled people. Which one's that? This is disabled people in Britain and discriminating case for anti discrimination legislation. Yeah, and there's lots in there about BCODP. I remember reading it. So I worked yeah, there for is. Them. Because worked BC... for... BCODP, you know, I mean, there's another, there's other stuff that I've written which has got like, um... oh, I will talk about talk about all this next week get your questions together so next week i'm not talking all the time have a fantastic day and thank you very much for your time for demand have to go because we've got to go shopping to get the groceries in for next week fabulous nice speaking to you it's lovely and i won't touch the computer so it'll all work next week Marvelous. whichever day you want thursday or friday thanks colin take care see you later you will bye, -bye. bye.